Mark Foley. Hi, BG. Hi, Monica. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good. I have a scenery tonight, a, a scene change. It is all because of the jacket I'm wearing. <laughs> the jacket matched the wall a little too much and it was annoying me, but I don't have any other jackets with me right now. So I decided I had to just change positions. I think it looks good, right? I think it looks great. So um, we are filming this on November 2nd, Monday, um, which is, it's kind of a nice uh, distraction from mm. everything else in the world right now. Um, I, and I don't know when this is gonna air, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy time drinking, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but anyway, we've been having some fun. We've seen some really cool shows. We started watching Northern Exposure, the old TV show. That's fun. I hadn't seen it before. It is. It's it, it's quirky, and it, I think it was probably at the time. I don't know when that was, but I think it was what late nineties, maybe. No, it was early nineties. I think it was nineties. 90 okay. Yeah. Well, time flies when you're my age. So, but um, it was different from anything I've ever seen. Yeah, you know, and it was shot totally in Alaska, and they showed the, uh, you know, the, the nights when they lasted twenty three hours. And, yeah, and the moose, and then yeah, and <clears throat> and the moose always would run around the moose in, is great. in the cities, and uh, it, it it was like going back in time because the buildings and everything looked like um nine i mean uh 1890 kind of yeah. wooden structures like in a and western back. movie but the characters were wonderful so. yeah it's fun we're having fun we've got we're just we've only watched a few episodes but I, i'm i think i'm committed to it yeah. and we watched on netflix helen reddy's i am woman i cried I grew up with Helen Reddy, you know, it's like my mom was a singer, is a singer. And, you know, she, I think I came out of the womb singing, you're my world. So uh, that's like, that hits home for me. It was a great movie. I thought it was, it was. She's and the music was good too. I've forgotten how much I liked that music back when I was in rock and roll bands. Well, and you were asking me about the personnel. I'll have to ask George if any of that was recorded in, in Nashville, I'm assuming most of it was LA based, but um, we'll have to ask him and see if he has any insight on that. Um, okay, well, speaking of George, oh, before I bring them on, um, we have merchandise folks, new merchandise. So um, go to bgadare.com and check out, we've got long sleeve and short sleeve t-shirts. We've got hoodies, masks, wine glasses, and you know, a hundred plus different albums to purchase. So <laughs> go and buy some stuff. It'll be fun. Um, whether it's holiday gifts or just a little selfish gift for yourself, you should go and do that. Um, well, our friend George Tidwell is back with us. He is always so kind and marvelous on the show and he's the king of puns. So I'm anxious to hear what puns he's going to throw at us tonight. Um, and we have a very special guest, Marvin Stam. Do you want to say anything about Marvin? Yeah. Um, well, I uh, I realized that I had met him uh, earlier than I thought I had <laughs> because he came in, um, and I don't know when this was, but it was back in somewhere in the in the two thousands. I was called to a Sunday afternoon uh, concert that we have at, at the Frisk Museum here. My friend Laurie, who is uh, my bass player's wife, um, had an emergency in her family, you know, her grandmother or aunt or something. And she had to leave quickly on that Sunday morning. And so Roger called me and said, Marvin Stamm's here and I need a piano player. So I just jumped at it. Mm -hmm. I had met Marvin earlier than that, but yeah. um, had never played with him. And it was really fun. It was, yeah. um, we all just, uh, I think it was Jim White on drums. Yeah. And uh, Roger and me and, and 
the wonderful trumpet player. And stick around because at the end of this, you'll get to hear um, actually uh, a, a song from that actual. One of those, yeah, that, one of those things that we did. And we, we actually opened with um, There Is No Greater Love. And that was uh, filmed that same weekend at the Nashville Jazz Workshop the, the night before right. Jazz Cave. Um, and that featured Marvin, of course, George, um, his buddy George, uh, Jim White, Dennis Soley, Roger mm -hmm. Spencer, and Lori Meacham. Um, and thanks to the workshop for providing that footage to us. It's, it's um, they're remarkable performances. So anyway, Marvin is, um, I was looking at his bio and I just want to name some of the people that he's worked with, recorded with, toured with. This BG, we've been really lucky to have some pretty iconic people on the show. And usually as I start to read these names, that's when I get a little nervous and a little starstruck. So my hands are going to start getting shaky here. Um, we've got Stan Cat, um, Woody Herman, oh, yeah. Jones, Mel Lewis, Benny Goodman, Frank Sinatra, Quincy yeah. Jones, Oliver Nelson, Wes Montgomery, Freddie Hubbard, uh, Stanley Turrentine, Bill Evans, Michelle Legrand, Frank Foster, Paul Desmond, George Benson, Bob Menser, Bill Mays, Rufus Reed, Ed Sof, George Tidwell, B.G. Adair. This is <laughs> crazy fun. Um, he has multiple albums out, obviously with other artists and certainly his own projects, and we'll make sure everyone knows where to find those um, through all of this. But wow, he, that's like a compendium of jazz musicians that you crazy. always want to play with. That's crazy. We didn't yeah. spend book enough time with him tonight, I can already tell, but he's an educator. Um, he likes good wine. He's a he's a he's a good guy, and uh, we're thrilled that he's here with us. So, um, might I introduce them now? Will that be okay? That'd be great. All right. Well, please help me welcome George. Help us welcome George Tidwell. Hello. Hi, George. Hi, George. Hi friends. And we have Marvin Stam. Good evening. Marvin. Ta -da. Ta -da. Good to be here with you guys. Oh, it's good uh, to see you. What a treat to see you. I, I, I suggested you know, I, earlier. BG, I'll t I was just going to tell BG, the first time we met was uh, when you were doing a radio show at WMUT with, uh, I can't remember who your partner was, the gentleman uh, who was who was there with you, but we did an interview one afternoon. Oh, I think it was. Thoughts. I think it was when uh, I came down to do a concert at, uh, at Middle Tennessee State. Middle Tennessee State. Yeah. 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 Oh, that would be WMOT, was it? WMOT. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm you know, 81. They... What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got two years yeah. on you, but I, I talk like that too. <laughs> um, they, they have, uh, unfortunately, um, the school has changed that station to an Americana station now. So we don't really have a, a jazz um, radio station nearby like we did. That one was the only one between Chicago and Miami, and it was getting great, rave reviews, but the curriculum got changed, and so it went away. A great loss, too. That was a yes, great station. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I did. I, I remember hearing that interview between the two of you all. It was great. I had forgotten so that. Nice. I really had. Yeah, yeah it, it was it was really nice. Everything was so relaxed, uh, and, and, you know, I mean, that's to me, you know, we're all just players, people, yeah. you know, I mean, this, 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 just because you live in New York or LA, it's no different than being in Chicago or Nashville. You know, you are what you are and you do what you do. And the people like us get an opportunity to live and work with some of the best people in the world, regardless of the city you lived in. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I was in North Texas, I worked uh, with some of the top players in Dallas these guys could sit in the studio anywhere in LA, New York, Paris, London. Mm -hmm. They were unbelievable musicians. And most of the recorded world didn't know who they were. They were doing mostly jingles and radio IDs. Right. Yeah. And yeah. and 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 if you listen to the background on those IDs, the playing was just hellacious. I mean, yeah. the writing was amazing. And those players and it's, you know, I mean, the thing is, is that we're all doing what we do because we love to do it. And we've been fortunate enough to make a living. Yeah, it. Yeah. Other than that, just where we live, there's no difference between the quality okay. or the people, you know. Uh, but, and don't you find in almost 
any city where there's a musical presence, there are some great players. Oh, yeah. Players with, that people don't know <laughs> about, but that you would be happy to play with any time. Sure. sure. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you about uh, a couple of guys. <clears throat> it seems to me years ago, and I think you and I, or you must have given me the uh, email address for Don Sheffield. Yeah. Oh. Uh, now, I had yeah, never I had never met Don at that time, really. Uh, but it seems that when we were in high school and there used to be tryouts for all state bands and so on, Don... Uh, wasn't he from Arkansas? Yeah, yes, he's from Arkansas. So, so he and somebody came back talking about uh, this trumpet player who made uh, solo chair at the Arkansas All State Band, and I remembered that name for the longest time. And it, and what they told me about him was that he was just one of the finest trumpet players, young oh, trumpet yeah. players that ever heard. Yeah, true. The next thing I I knew about Don was that he was in the Nashville Symphony. Mm -hmm. And then I think when you and I somehow talked earlier in those years, uh, you told me about Don and there was another trumpet player, you, Don, and someone else who did a lot of the recorded work. Can't remember the other player's name. Who would that be? You know, over the years, that other person changed in that, like back there, there was Cam Mullins mm -hmm. who did a lot of stuff. Um, Glenn, Baxter, Glenn Baxter and, and Carl Garvin. Uh, but it's so true about Don, and he's he's a perfect example of uh, uh, what you'd have to have to call a local player mm -hmm. that could play with anybody. He was just was a brilliant player, and yeah. still he doesn't play anymore, but he's still around and doing well. And yeah, and I will make sure he sees this because he's a, of course a huge fan of yours too. Well, please please give him my best regards. I'm glad to yeah, hear well. that he's that he's still around and he's well. Yeah, yeah he is still great. But you know, you you saw. You remember when the, uh, what was it, that they used to be, was it uh, Cogbill? Tommy Cogbill? Tommy oh, Cogbill. Yeah. yeah. From Memphis. I was a local bass player in Memphis, along with Bill Justice mm -hmm. and that whole group of guys that eventually oh. came to Nashville as the American group or the American right. music group right. or something like right. that. And every every pop star was was coming to Nashville to record all of their stuff. Now I was watching uh, your opening when you mentioned uh, Helen Reddy and and the film that you watched last night or the day before. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering how many of those people and with Tommy and Bill Justice and those guys you must have worked with all of them, George. Well, we I mean same situation as you, uh, <clears throat> just by virtue of being here and kind of knowing what, what we were doing, we got to play with some of the most wonderful people. And also uh, by virtue of the television work we did. But oh, interestingly, yeah, yeah. Tommy Cogbill, I mean, I bet you remember too that he was a jazz guitar player. Mm -hmm. And that's what I thought he was in Memphis. And then I turned around and he was the most famous rock and roll bass player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, and, and was Steve Cropper in Nashville yeah, too? Yeah, Steve is here, still here. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mike Leach. I don't know if you remember Mike. He's yes. Another, another bass player. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I used to work with Mike a lot. Yeah. A great I bass think player. He passed away, didn't he? He did. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But uh, he yeah, was all really of those guys, player. all of those guys oh, had perfect. wonderful careers up here mm -hmm. uh, and great players and, you know, just genius players, really. I'll tell you one that doesn't come up except he did some major things. I don't think he was part of this group or he could have been, I don't know. Reggie um, on guitar. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh my goodness. Just, oh, yeah. he, he just passed away last year. He Beautiful did. Player. Yeah. Um, but he was so famous and I don't think any of us realized it when he came and he'd, he'd been working with Gladys Knight and. Oh, he was a beautiful kind of, player. You know, one of these yeah. big, and it, he was such a, he he really could have been a jazz player if he wanted to. He can do anything. Yeah, you know, right. And a great guy. And like and like almost guy. all the almost all the great players, just yeah. mo modest and oh yeah. Uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't get any sense from the, his demeanor that he was the giant star musical he was. presence. He was. He was. You know, t talking about just mentioning <clears throat> Bill Justice. Before he moved to Nashville, and you must remember this, George. Yeah, but he, he, 
Yeah, yeah, go ahead. He had the hippest dance band yeah. in Memphis. He was his writing was so marvelous. He had a four brothers front yep. line, three yeah. tenors and baritone. Uh, most of the time it was one trumpet and, and uh, it was either Richard Mostella or Johnny Davis. Right. And, uh, oh, the trombone player who owned Jack a grocery store. Oh, I was going to say Jackie Thomas. It was Jackie Thomas, but I know who you're thinking of. Uh, he was there before Jackie. Yeah. And then, and then, Bill, then later Bill expanded uh, the band a bit, and I ended up playing on it. And that's really, that band is what allowed me to become a player because they were so, like you, they were so kind to me when I, really didn't deserve to be there. Uh, well, they, 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 yeah, Bill Justice, a, a big part of, and BG, Bill yeah. loved BG's playing too. He used to do this funny thing. I, I was working as a secretary at Capitol Records when I met Bill, when he came, the first time he came to town to live here. And uh, he was on Carl Garvin's band one night at the Hermitage Hotel and I walked in we started playing and everybody was going crazy over the tenor player and it was him. And Justice. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I met him. But he started, um, he was doing stuff for Capitol records and other people. And so he would have to send me the secretary, the bills for copying and uh, all the things that he'd done arranging all that stuff. And he was, <laughs> we were on 17th Avenue in a little building while we were waiting for capital capital to build the building they did. <laughs> and we were all cramped up in this little office. And I'd get these wonderful letters in the morning mail that said, Miss Junior Mance, Capital <laughs> Records. <laughs> he always sent that to me. So funny. These bills so I could give them to my back. And he, he he was so wonderful with puns and things like that. He just, oh yeah. I mean, we've all got a bunch of them. He'd say, if it was a really bad demo, he would say, let's cut this turkey before it will. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd count off the thing. Yeah, my, 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 so my father had a, 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 a haberdashery down in, uh, in downtown Memphis on Main Street. Sure. About a half a block from Beale Street and about a half a block farther from Lansky Brothers and all that. Yeah. So he knew all of the people, some of those people from that era. But it turns out that Bill Justice's father was a customer in my dad's store. Oh, no kidding. Wow. And then Bill Bill came in and started buying his clothes there. And and it's just funny. I can't remember exactly what my dad said to him, but he said to him, he says, my trumpet, my son's talks about wanting to be a trumpet player. He says, but nah, he's going to come back in the clothing business with me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, you know, and then, oh, I'm sorry, I was going to say, just just uh, growing up uh, and getting a chance to meet Bill and then to be, to meet the guys like uh, uh, Richard Mosteller and, and yeah. Johnny yeah. Davis, who were two beautiful trumpet players and all the guys in, in, in the band well, and the that there, Jackie great. Thomas. Yeah. Yeah, Jameson Brent and uh, wow. Cowboy. Just all those great on, saxophone on players. Yeah. yeah. That, band was, was, that band was responsible for me losing almost every girlfriend I ever had because we'd, <laughs> we'd, go, we'd go to dances and Bill's band, this is when I was ninth grade, 10th grade, but I, I was already totally hooked on the music. And Bill's <laughs> band would be playing and it was dance music, but the charts were so amazing and players were so good. I just sat and turned my chair toward the band <laughs> for two hours, and that's really how I that's really how I ended up playing with them. They finally said, "Why are you here all the time?" They were <laughs> so, so generous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to say because this is this is pivotal in my career. Um, <clears throat> during the '60s, I guess it was '60s, maybe early '70s. Um, he would go back and forth to Hollywood a lot of times writing for movies and stuff, you know, and he wrote for uh, Smokey and the Bandit and a, um, an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. I think it was his first one called the cowboy or the somebody. <laughs> yeah. And um, anyway, Bill called me to do some of the music for Smokey and the Bandit and, um, I can't remember the other piano player's name, 
but they did part of it in LA and part of it in Nashville. And we didn't know, I just answered the date, you know, and we played little clips and things like that for Smokey. And then it just went through the roof, you know. So when we get our little checks that, that are once a year kind of thing, you know, yeah. <laughs> I still look it up and it'll say, you know, from Australia or someplace, I'll get the bandit. Yeah. But it, it put me on the map with some of the producers and it really helped me for him to use me on things like that. Sure. Yeah. And um, so I still, I still have those when they come in once a year, those little things. Oh yeah. But, well, I, I, I want to say about the our <clears throat> Memphis period, um, because I was a few years younger than Marvin, uh, you, you Marvin were so kind to me as a, uh, not, not so finished player, uh, <laughs> with, with help and suggestions, but <clears throat> always so kind and uh, helpful. To, can, uh, I'm, I'm ignorant. Can we back up a little bit? Okay. Uh, I obviously know that you guys <coughs> and knew each other, but I have two questions. One, do you remember when you guys met for the first time, like how you met? And two, did you study with the same teachers? Actually, I just told Bibi's question because she was going to ask that. I oh, that's okay. That but well, uh, I, don't, I don't remember the first time, but you were at East High School, right? White Station. White Station. Yeah, right. And and I was at Central. Right. Are you are you two years younger than me? Yeah. So you were two years ahead, and you were you were well known already because you was you were such a fine young player already. So but we, I, but, we sort of met by osmosis, I think, like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I you you know, my father. Uh, we had lived from the time I was a year and a half old. We had lived on North Parkway, right. And when I was on so my seventeenth birthday, which must have been at the end of my junior year in high school, <clears throat> we moved out to East on the Street Pinehurst, which was right near Wallace, which was right near where you lived. Right. Right. right? You weren't far from Wallace yeah. in Walnut Grove. No, right. Uh, a few blocks. And I, and and I remember there was some. I, I remember sitting in my car at your house. I give you a ride from somewhere, and we sat and yeah. talked for a long time. And we seemed to do that a couple of times. Yeah. And I and it, and it may have been sometime when I came back in the summer from college. Yes. At some point, but I seem to remember it from when we were when we were in school. And I'm not quite sure how we met, but it goes back a long way for sure. Yeah. Yeah, do you remember? Do you remember when we met for sure? I think the first time we officially met was at a one of those uh, solo festivals, um, maybe somewhere somewhere up east from Memphis. Uh, and um, of course, I knew who you were because you were. Let's face it, you were well known. Uh, so I just I think I just introduced myself to you and all that swarm of players warming up and going in and out of rooms. Um, and then I, I came to Central to hear you play a couple of times, and that from there I think we just we just kind of fell together as East Memphis people with similar interests. I remember uh, being in Richard Mosteller's. Speaking of Richard, his uh, record store that he had out in uh, right on on Poplar, right. And you, uh, as a matter of fact, this is one of the great things you could ever do for anybody. You actually introduced me to Ray Charles in that. In that record shop. Wow! <laughs> oh, wow. He, he said, "You know, because I was I was already becoming kind of a jazz snob." And Marvin said, "Well, you know, there's all kinds of great music. Listen to this." And he was so oh. right. He was okay. so right. Yeah. I, I'm. I'm sorry. I'm. I had a. I had a moment. I thought Ray Charles was in the store, <laughs> and you introduced no. Ray Charles. <laughs> <laughs> like, you are the coolest person ever. No. <laughs> okay, you know, I think we both would have loved it if he had been there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I swear I haven't had that much to drink yet. I, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, yeah. it, it, there were uh, we, we grew, interestingly enough, we grew up at a at a really good time in Memphis music. Oh yeah. But Ooh. we both yeah. uh, and I, I you correct me if I'm wrong, but we both missed 
some of the great part of Memphis music because yeah. Memphis was segregated. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to yeah. ask about that. <laughs> yeah. I never, I never met, uh, I never met Booker Little. No. The great trumpet player who died at 21 from, uh, I think it was uh, the blood, the A blood board, yeah. Yeah, leukemia. Yeah. And I didn't meet people like uh, uh, Harold Mayburn and, and that group of play Frank Strozier, those guys, until oh, I went to, went to New York. Right. Yeah. And then, and of course. Good Rich. I'm sorry, say again. I'm sorry. Um, Andy Goodrich, alto player. I didn't meet him until later on, also. Yeah. 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 He's still in Chicago, I believe, right? Well, he's the last I heard away. from him. It was he a, did. Uh, yeah, yeah, he passed away. A great player. About five years ago. I didn't realize that. He, he went on to get <clears throat> his doctorate and he became a uh, consultant for black universities um, and made trips all over. But he still played. Yeah. And yeah, I stayed in touch with him. Such um, a great player. He lived here for quite a while and I stayed in touch with him until he passed away. The BG and I were in his band for a while. I'm That's crazy. right. But yeah, Marvin, you're so right. There was that whole wealth of of jazz players of that particular age. And even uh, later, you know, when I was maybe 62 or 63, when you were, you know, out and on the band and so forth, on, on Kenton's band and done with school, uh, there were so many great players, black players in town that you still couldn't really play with. Right. Uh, like Fred Ford and... Uh, uh, a couple of great alpha, just a bunch of great players, but it really still was not any uh, not anything you could really do. Very frustrating. Well, you know, uh, there used to be what they called the Memphis Piano Mafia, which was Harold Mayburn, mm -hmm. James yeah. James Williams, right. Mulgrew Miller, and Donald Brown. Right. Well, mm -hmm. I knew the three young guys when they were students at Mem at the old Memphis State, right. now the right. University of Memphis. You knew must have met them and played. Yeah. Well, I don't know whether you played with them, but it's interesting you mentioned Fred Ford. I got a chance to play with Fred Ford. Uh, I used to go home when I was married, as my parents grew older. I would go home for a week at a time, maybe three times, four times a year. And sometimes my wife and the kids would come, but sometimes, you know, just for expenses and what's going on at home and whatever, I would come in by myself. And I can't remember who told me, but, uh, I might I might have run into to Bill Tyus. Yeah. You remember oh Bill Drummer? Oh Lord, yes. And and he I said, Where what are you doing? He says, Well, I'm working with Honeymoon and Fred Ford down at the Peabody. Wow. They were playing playing down there for a while. And he said, Why don't you come on down? So I went down and I'd been in New York for a while and you know, I've been playing with with uh a lot of the guys and we were playing a lot of the you know, the the hip tunes that were around and all that stuff. And we went in and I played with those guys that night. When I left, I said, wow, <laughs> what what a reminder lesson okay. about the blues. Yeah. Yep. Oh, Fred was an amazing player. Man, that was that was that was just beautiful. You so know? BG uh honeymoon that, that Marvin is talking about was Honeymoon Garner, a, a piano player, and he was a mm -hmm. disc jockey. And he often held uh, uh down the jam session chair at a a place called the Sharecropper. Do you remember the I Sharecropper? Remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, can, I can remember uh, hearing Marvin on one of his trips home from, I guess he was still in school, but you came in and you were, you went down and played. and uh, I did? Uh, no, Marvin. Marvin. Oh, Marvin. <laughs> yeah. But I hadn't heard, I hadn't seen played, him in a while. Yeah. He'd been gone. And you came in and played some tunes, all in Harmon Mute. Uh, uh, a, uh, Cliff Akerd, I think, was playing bass. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was uh, uh, quite, it was a, good. quite, quite. A, <laughs> speaking of a wake-up call for a young trumpet player, yeah. but but that was <laughs> just a, that was just a great place to to go and play. It, it was, was it, it's the only place that I knew of to go and play. Tommy mm -hmm. Ferguson, I guess, held that Saturday night. Yeah. yeah. Down for for years. Yeah. And and uh, honeymoon Mamie Dell Merriweather. Yeah. She used to sing in between Tommy's sets. And she used to sing there during the week, and she was a she was a blues singer, and she'd sit down at the piano, and if you just sat down, you you wouldn't want to leave. Yeah. I mean, she she had she was so soulful, mm -hmm. and it was just so from the heart and so simple, you know. Yeah. And there's just you know there's so many things that 
if you take the time to really think about it and think about all the people who just were so meaningful to your life in music, yeah. people who without them, you know, you would have, uh, you would have missed so much. You wouldn't have learned as much. And hopefully they were the kind of people that taught you uh, what real respect for people who had been there and done that. Right. You know, yep. Yep. Uh, that's, well. But you are one of those people for me, and so is Bee Gees. Mm. Bee Gees, uh, well, right back at you, keeper of the flame. But well, uh, since since uh, Monica mentioned this, would you feel like saying a few words about your? You, you've been such an inspiration to young players. I know you had a uh, private teacher when you were in high school that was that meant a, that meant a lot to you. And I'm just and I'm wondering, if you just say a few words about about him? Yeah, uh, his, his name was Perry Wilson. And he, Perry had uh, gone to school at Berkeley for a while in Boston. Now, you got to remember, when I first started studying with Perry, it was in the 10th grade. So that would have been 1950, 1954, 55 school year, I think. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so when he was in Berkeley, Berkeley was a small school, nothing like what it is now, which is yeah. a g gigantic organization. And it really was strictly a jazz school. Herb Pomeroy was there. Uh, uh, and a bunch of the guys that I met later uh, who were quite well known, John Laporta, who made a mm -hmm. reputation first, right. I think, with Woody's band, Ray Santisi, the pianist. Uh, oh, gosh. Uh, anyway, a whole number of these people. Well, when he was there, he played with Herb Pomeroy's band in the beginning of when Herb had the band. As a matter of fact, on one of the first vinyls that I think Herb made, Perry is in the trumpet section. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. But Perry also played violin, hmm. and he was a he was a very good arranger's piano player. Yeah. So he had he had a real good background in music. And when when I started studying with him, he was one of the busy pretty busy trumpet players in town. He also was a band director at Manassas first. This is before he went to White Station, years right. years after you were there. Right. And uh, uh, he was he was a just a sweetheart of a guy and he basically adopted me <laughs> and musically adopted me. Yeah. And I used to go in on Saturdays, my dad would pay for my music lessons and I think it was $6 a lesson. And we would start off with about 45 minutes of studying out of out of the old method books, the Arbenz book and the St. Jacome book and uh, different books, the Schlossberg studies and Close finger and tone exercises, right. finger exercise book for technique. And then he would spend about 45 minutes playing duets with me out of the Amsden book and some oh, of yeah. the uh, St. Yeah. Jacome stuff. Wow. Now that was that's an hour and a half, and then he would say, "Come on, let's go down to the piano room." This was it. I took all my lessons at Coley Stoltz Music well, Store. Well, you had to go upstairs. Yeah, I had to go upstairs, <laughs> yeah. but you had to come down for the piano room, and the piano rooms were the old time. There was no acoustic tile in those days, so they were all egg cartons on the wall right. to uh, <laughs> to keep the sound down. And he would teach me tunes, not with music, everything by ear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. So yeah. he was, he was, that, that's where a great deal of the development of my ear came from, along with, and I have to say this, of my own brother, my older brother, who was a jazz fan, starting when I first started playing the trumpet in the seventh grade, he let me go and play, try to play with his records. <laughs> and that was wow. my first, that was my first jazz teacher. Perry was my second one. That's great. You know, but, that, that's cool that your brother was a, a supporter who pushed you. Yeah, he's he's five and a half years older than me. Still lives in Memphis. He's retired oh, now. Yeah, cool. and and he he's always been very supportive of everything I've done. Mm -hmm. But but getting back to Perry, you can imagine if six dollars bought you about two and a half hours of lessons, wow. covering everything yep. you would want, and and he really, uh, you know, he he didn't encourage me to be one over the other. His idea was for me to just open myself up to everything I could and then see where I want to go. Yeah. You know, and it was, it was, uh, it was a great experience. And I kept, we kept in touch up until the time that uh, 
that he passed away, which was about eight years ago. No, okay. yeah, about eight years ago now. And uh, I, you know, his gosh, when he came to Memphis, he must have been in his twenties. I think he must have been 24, 25, something like yeah. that. Anyway, a, a great influence, as were my band directors. Do you remember Jack Foster? Yes, I do. He was my, he was, I started playing in junior, what we call junior high school in those days. Never heard the words middle school. <laughs> but in junior high school, which was then uh, uh, seven, eight, and nine, and high school was 10, 11, and 12. As opposed to six, seven, and eight, and now nine through twelve being high school. Mm -hmm. Jack was a very good, very good Memphis trumpet player, also. Yeah, and he was also. Did you know he was uh, a a naval pilot? No, he was in the reserve, and uh -huh. he he took a couple of his students out to Millington, and showed us around the airport. And you know, I think we got to sit in an airplane one day. You know, not uh -huh. not flying. But, but yeah. actually sit in the airplane. And he used to come around and pick up about three or four of his better students. He only taught junior high school. But he would take us to a record store. This was before Richard opened his store. Right. It used to be on Poplar Avenue. And, uh, and we would sit and listen to records. And the first record that I ever bought was... Uh, Beethoven's third by the New York Philharmonic, Bruno Walter uh, conducting. Wow. And the second one was Pictures in, no, the New World Symphony by Raphael Kubelek and the Chicago Symphony. Mm. And I've been a fan of, I've been a fan of, uh, of uh, classical music ever since I picked up the horn, but wow. partic particularly orchestral music. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And I have to tell you, George, I'll send this to you because I know you'll be interested in, in hearings. Today, I get up and before I go out and do my running and stuff like that, I, I spend some time on the floor stretching and trying to get the muscles to wake up a little bit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Computer floor with me and I was watching a YouTube and listening to the Chicago Symphony under George Schulte playing in Budapest, playing the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. Oh, that's my favorite. And the, and, that is my favorite and piece. And, and this was the Herseth days. Oh, uh, yeah. Herseth oh, and Bill no. Scarlett and those guys. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I'll say, I got to send you this. Uh, I'm, I can find it and send you the link. Yeah, and send B. I'll it is, and I'll, move, yeah, I'll, send I'll get it to VZ. Yeah. yeah. It, extraordinary. extraordinary. Yeah. I don't have your email address, BG. Yes, I do. I have it from the from the email, from the letter. You okay. I'll, I'll, yeah. Yeah. Any, anyway, that's that's kind of my, that. And then I went to high school at Memphis under uh, Mr. Mack, A.E. McLean, was one of these old school kind of people. You had a responsibility as he had a responsibility, which meant that you had to be prepared in your music in, in for the band, the concert band. There was no jazz band. There was only concert band. Right. And you had to be prepared musically uh, all the time. I mean, if it, if it came down to some, there was a guy who was an excellent trumpet player in Memphis who played in the band before I was even there. And he, he didn't want to practice, and he didn't show up at, at one of the rehearsals. And Mr. Mack just said to him, you want to play in this band? And he said, yes. He says, well, it doesn't seem like it because your interest, <laughs> your interest is it doesn't seem to be there. You're not prepared musically. So I'll tell you what, you just spend the rest of the year in study hall to get about <laughs> it. Oh, and this, wow. and this, was, this was a very, 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 very good player, but his attitude wasn't part of a team. Well, that's part of the lesson, I guess. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Make yeah. Go at the door. But he used to come around. I, I finally did all of my, uh, uh, you know, the, the mathematics and English and all my courses pretty much by the time I got to my senior year. my Whatever my classes were for my studies were in the morning, and I had the afternoon pretty free. So I took, well, yeah. took study hall in, in each day in the band room and he would, he would hear me practicing. And then if I kind of stopped and took a rest for too long, <laughs> the door would open and he'd stick his head in and he'd say, 
Well, I guess you decided to become a local trumpet player. Uh, oh, that's funny. Oh, that's great. But that's he used great. to he if you if he heard you practicing and he knew you were getting frustrated with something, he would stop in and say, "Marvin," he says, "Put a pound of patience in this pocket, and put a pound of patience in that pocket, and take your time." Excellent. You'll get there. Excellent. I mean, he was he really he really presented an attitude to follow. And he was a fantastic, absolutely fantastic band director. So I, 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 can't, I can't tell you how fortunate my early years in Memphis were to my development as a musician. Yeah. And uh, coming from an old school family, uh, respect for older people was just part of my upbringing. Okay. Oh, yeah. And, and Lord help me if I didn't respect Mm -hmm. If my father knew about it, he didn't, that was it. Yeah. You know, he didn't put up with anything else like that, you know. <laughs> now, George, did you study with any of the same teachers? I actually, uh, this was maybe after Marvin had gone on to North Texas. Uh, I took the same, same kind of $6 lessons with Perry for oh. part of a year. And uh, I can't tell you how much difference it made to me. And he basically did the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember the Amsden book. And he also had, uh, this was about the time that there began to be some fake books that were published or some, or some record, some tunes off of records. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a book of yeah, some of the West Coast guys. Anyway, just some tunes. Uh, that weren't standard tunes. Uh, and he showed me that, uh, like Shorty Rogers and those kind of mm. folks. That's what mm -hmm. I'm thinking of. Right. Uh, and he would help me. He was the first one that helped me understand that uh, a, a C chord had more than C in it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> because in those days, you didn't get much in the way of theory, you know? That's true. So he opened a lot of doors for me, and he was, you know, kind to me, uh, of course, uh, and generous too. That Marvin's so right; you got a lot for your six dollars. Mm. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. That's and Peachy, when you when you were a young person, I mean, did you have uh, did you have in mind when you were 18, 19, 20 to become a professional musician? Oh yeah, I was already in college at that time. Um, I had, my father was a mechanic. He was a master mechanic and people were always calling him up and saying, come work on my airplanes and stuff. But he, he worked in our little town as the manager of a uh, standard oil station. And we had the work bays back there where they, they changed the carburetors and did everything, you know, to cars. And he loved it. That's what he, he, he was a mechanic. He wanted to be fooling with something all the time. And my mother was a bookkeeper. My grandmother was a school teacher. She, she taught the fourth grade. We had a school that was 125 people, one through 12. That's how little the town wow. was. That's funny. And uh, so I had piano lessons from the time I was five. And I came home crying because I had already learned how to play some tunes with my father. And the lady wouldn't let me do anything except dun, 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 you know, <laughs> left, right, left, right. <laughs> so my mother had to go and say, you know, let her play something once in a while that she has in her head. And my mother had all the records that you would like in the 40s, like Glenn Miller and Woody Herman and Count Basie and June Christie and Stan Kenton. And my dad had Western Swing. And he loved the Opry. So I got everything in here. And I just, it didn't occur to me that I should be thinking about one particular kind of music. It was yeah. just, and we sang a lot. My mother was Irish from a big old Irish family. And everybody told stories and sang and stuff. So I just had music all the time when I was little. My mother had a little a Crosley radio, white plastic in the kitchen window. And it was on all the time for dance music and all that. So, and I had a teacher through high school and she was great. She was, she had come back home from Cincinnati Conservatory and had a degree from there and she was terrific. 
So she introduced me to Brahms and Beethoven and Liszt and all that. And I started a really good classical education. So my grandmother said, if you'll major in music, I'll pay your way through college. Don't go anywhere else, just go to Western. So I did. Western Kentucky had the best piano department around. We had artist teachers that had studied with me. One of them studied with uh, Don Nani, who had studied with Brahms. Wow. Another one had studied with Claudio Arau in his classes. And then Claudio Arau, the thread was back through um, Liszt. So our piano threads were very strong. And she was the one that get, got me to go to Western and major in classical music. They didn't have a jazz program but they had the best piano teachers in that part of the world. Mike Longo came to Western and stayed four years and graduated. So he was my best friend from- Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, and we just lost him in March. Yeah, we did. Cool. Yeah, right. But um, anyway, so when I got to college, I was a year younger than everybody else because I had skipped grade. And in my senior class, I mean, my uh, freshman class, their theory and everything. Uh, there were several young men coming back from Korea. So I was 16, they were 25, 26, something like that. Married, had kids, but they all knew how to play. They'd all been in orchestras and they wanted to be band directors. So I got to be in a band in the first six weeks of my college. And wow. Jerry Williams was an alto player He'd been in Panama, and he learned how to play all that um, sambas and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. he, he could read the spots off the wall. And he loved music, and we all would buy records. We'd, we'd put our pennies in <laughs> until it came to $3, and we'd buy the newest thing, you know, the LP. And we'd go over to his house, and his wife would make chili. We'd all sit on <laughs> sit on the on the ground they didn't have any furniture it's just rugs and pillows. <laughs> and uh, they were in the gi bill program on the the campus was where they lived and uh but i learned so much that year i think when i look back on it when i went from high school to that first year with these guys showing me what to do i think that was the year that i learned more than anything else since then I was just like a sponge. It was like, oh, teach me this one. Teach oh, me that's this great. One, you know? That's great. And um, so I had Jerry with me all four years, and he formed a little band with Chuck Sanders. Uh, George knows him. Great bass player. Yeah. And um, he was a bass player. Sometimes we'd have a drummer, but most of the time we didn't. But we played. The first, the first job I remember was um, Bowling Green Country Club from 8 to 12, ah. Saturday night, we all made $8 each, $2 an hour. <laughs> but $8 went a little further in those days. Well, so. yeah, they did. And so I got that, plus I got this wonderful teacher who had studied with the guy that studied with Brahms. That's great. So I was listening to classical music by then and doing all kinds of stuff. And it occurred to me when I played Chopin and things like that, if I transferred that legato to Stardust or any other ballad, it developed better than if you're just, you know, walking yeah. around on it. And I tell all the students that I've had, if you want to sound like Bill Evans or you want to sound like a real piano player like whoever you're favorites are study classical music and especially Chopin yeah. and it works absolutely it, it makes your touch better you know I've played with Bill Mays uh, oh, from great. about 1995 until probably <laughs> two years ago <clears throat> when a lot of the business stuff started kind of slowing down for, for actually, I guess for both of us mm -hmm. and Bill and his wife uh, wanted to get away during the winters. So they bought a little one bedroom place in West Palm and they go down there November, beginning of November and come back uh, sometime around the first of May. 
But because of that, things have kind of drifted away as far as, and Bill's interest has gotten back from some of the projects that we did over the years to going back to working with his trio with Matt Wilson and Martin Wind on bass. <clears throat> so, but all, all during those years and, and, you know, ever since I've known Bill, he would try to spend at least three hours of day, a day playing. Mm -hmm. And at least two hours of that was very, very heavy classical. Playing, yeah. Wow. That's great. You know, and Liszt and Cherney and all of the books that, you know, that developed that technique. And, and the etudes. Yeah. And, I, and all that. Yeah. yeah. I found so much of the, uh, in playing with Bill, there was so much of a similarity in the <laughs> in the approach to moving from note to note, and the use of space. And then he was the one that that we started playing, where we would improvise together. I was just going to say mm -hmm. some of the things you guys did like that, fantastic, just amazing and, stuff. And it just kind of came about naturally. And then what's <laughs> happened with my friend Mike Holliver, who I'm now working with, is the same kind of thing has been happening. And uh, he's he's a he's someone that uh, that uh, I hope you'll become familiar with at some point in time because he is just a marvelous musician. He happens to be a great composer mm. uh, and very much uh, heavy uh, big band writing. But it, his the, his writing is not so much big band and I call it a, a, an orchestra because he mm -hmm. treats the big band as an orchestra as opposed oh. to just the typical swinging <clears throat> kind of big yeah. band writing that you do. And he, he's an amazing person. But, yeah, that's but a that's I, a beautiful I agree, record. I mean, the one, that, the hiding out mm -hmm. that he did. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. yeah. I was so proud to be part of that project. I mean, those, everybody in the band was extraordinary. Yeah. <laughs> everybody, you know, uh, everyone in the saxophone section, the trombones were magnificent. And the trumpet sections, uh, Tony Cadillac playing lead, Lisa yeah. Whitaker, boy, we, is she some kind of great player. Yeah. You know, she's, she's still, she's about to uh, retire from the, uh, from the army now. Yeah, I think, yeah, she's just right now, yeah. Wow. Yeah, and she's, she's something else. I mean, she really is. And it, it's just great. And, and uh, Scott Winholt and I played the jazz and stuff. <laughs> Scott's another one of those fantastic uh, players, a Bill Adams student from, from uh, Indiana. That's, wow. a, that's a pretty fair trumpet section. No yeah. kidding. It's <laughs> no a, lot of, kidding. a lot of fun. But, yeah. but you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing when you, when you see most of the jazz musicians, or you talk to most of the jazz musicians, they will – they will talk about their classical either if they if they are not people who came up through a classical kind of tradition they can sit and talk to you about classical music yeah. and, many, and many of them will if you hear jazz musicians a lot of jazz musicians who play saxophone or trumpet there a lot of their articulation and stuff is a lot like woodwind players yeah. you know that you mentioned the legato but it's a kind of legato that for playing jazz fits just fits beautifully. Yeah. You know? And the, uh, the ears too, <clears throat> the ear is attracted to like Stravinsky, mm -hmm. that, that kind of thick stuff uh, that's, that would work in any kind of music. Uh, oh yeah. Bird, yeah. like Bird loves Stravinsky so much. Oh yeah. And what was it, the stories about, uh, there were <clears throat> many stories about uh, players, Miles, Lee Konitz, all those guys who did, uh, out of the uh, did uh, birth of the cool of the, right yeah used to go down to Gil Evans' place and listen to things and and uh, you know Rimsky Korsakov and uh, right. Prokofiev and and right. all this stuff you know and you know they came out and we, when you hear the stuff that Gil wrote for Miles it's just uh, oh that's gorgeous oh, absolutely that's gorgeous. Magnificent. still some of the greatest stuff ever written yeah now did you not <clears throat> to Go backwards a little bit. Did you not at one time uh, do a little tour with one of those um, uh, sketches of Spain or a? I did. I did. I did. I, yeah. I, Marvin, yeah. Yeah, I I played all three suites at different times with the uh, oh, Guildhall so Guildhall funny. Jazz Band in uh, in London. Right. <clears throat> I've never never performed them over here, but uh, did perform with them over there and. Uh, Great program, 
over there. I would love to have heard that. I, I know you, I'm sure it was gorgeous. It, well, you can, you can imagine being surrounded by Gil's music and you're yeah. standing in the middle. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's interesting that, that uh, to, to play that music, you really have to approach it with a respect uh, for the style in which they play. In other yeah. words, you can't, you can't just be a bebop bird and diz player right. and fit yeah. into the style of that music. Maybe because it's been played it's so much, so deep into the soul of people like you guys and myself who grew up with it or were, it was part of your growing up. All right. But, and I'll tell you, it was an interesting, uh, I had an interesting experience about three or four years ago. Uh, I got called to do a concert. Uh, it was the, I think it was the first year of the James Moody Jazz Festival in New Jersey, the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, <clears throat> beautiful hall. And the conductor was gonna be Vince Mendoza, who I've known since he was in, a student at Ohio State. We've been good friends since then. And they brought in Peter Erskine, uh, Christian McBride on bass. Uh, Wayne Bergeron came in to play lead trumpet. Yeah. On it. <laughs> uh, and uh, Bob Shepard came in on saxophone, so, and then filled it up with the New York Orchestra. And uh, wow. the was Terrence Blanchard and Sean Jones. Wow. Now, I've also known Sean since he was a student <clears throat> at Youngstown State. I'd never met Terrence before, but I'd, I'd heard his music, of course. Sure. And I was the thing that I was really curious about was how these guys, now Terrence and Sean both at this point in time were very established in their own directions as far as their style was concerned, right. how they would approach this music to see how exactly, you know, I mean, because it really takes, you have to think about it. This is not something right. you just get up and play the changes on stuff like oh, that. Yeah. <clears throat> it was beautiful. They, they had their individual, I mean, they, they, their individuality and their approach to the music was themselves, yeah. but it was played with respect to the stylistic approach that Mile and Gilds did. Sure. And, and it was just, it was wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful performance. I've heard other people play it and it sounds like just a solo guy playing over yeah. Gilds charts, mm -hmm. you know, and then yeah. for me, that doesn't make it. No, um, it, need, it needs to be in your body. <clears throat> for sure. That's a good quote. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, I was just thinking, uh, I one time saw uh, Gills, but this was a long time ago, maybe 1974. But uh, BG and I have a mutual friend, Maxine, who was his manager mm -hmm. and uh, Dexter Gordon's wife and biographer. Uh, but I was in New York playing something. Uh, for a week or so, and went to hear Gil Evans at the Village Van Vanguard, which, you know, was fantastic because it was a, a pretty pretty large band, <clears throat> and Lou Soloff was playing lead, and uh, uh, David Sanborn was playing in the band actually, which is that actually the first time I ever heard David Sanborn play. It was kind of stunning, but anyway, Gil had his he had a Rhodes piano. Uh, Fender Rose, and he had his scores. He was playing from the scores, and on the break, uh, I was I was sitting with Maxine, I think, and she said, "Now watch this." And he gathered up all his scores and took them under his arm with him to the break room because he didn't want anybody coming up <laughs> looking at his scores. <laughs> she said he she said he always did that. I'll be darned. Interesting. Thought, yeah, yeah. She told me one time um, we were talking about how Europe um, reveres musicians more than the United States does as a rule. They're always trying to cancel things so that public radio and television are going to be priced out of the woods, you know, and uh, they make it political. So, because a lot of the people that make the laws always say, well, you don't need that. That's just a frill. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so, to illustrate that, one year I was up there visiting her, and, and um, Gil Evans had just gotten a war an award for I don't know what it was, but it was some project of his, and it was going to go in the Smithsonian. 
mm. that year. Wow. And she said, would you like to know what his total income for the year was? She said it was seven seven thousand dollars. Wow! Yeah, and then he lived in one of those apartments at uh, Westbeth. Wow! You know, it's underwritten for musicians yeah. and yeah. Uh, all that. And he, so the whole the point was made. You know. Yeah, I mean that's a great sadness. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, I'm, I I didn't know. I I actually never met Gil personally, <clears throat> but. Uh, uh, a, lo a lot of the things that uh, he, he was the kind of individual that was not going to fit into the studio. Right. Bag. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, you know, the, the records he made that had, that were underwritten by Columbia records and things like that. And he made, he made a number of records under his own name that were absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. One beautiful, that he did yeah. with cannonball <laughs> yeah. and, uh, others that he did just on his own own music out of the out of the cool and into the hot and uh and even before that uh uh something on pacific jazz and so on but it was always it was always artistic music right and he never seemed to bernie glow told me the great lead trumpet player told me one time they were recording something uh on uh Suites. And Gil said, okay, let's go. So let's go from the top. And he had his hands up and the band's ready, waiting for the downbeat. And Gil is looking at the score. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he held this pose for like a minute and a half. There was something he saw that whatever it was, he didn't like the way he wrote it. <laughs> maybe he wanted to change it or, or whatever it yeah. was. But, you know, and, and, he was he was a real artist, and yeah, I guess oh yeah. and at a time when uh, I don't know you would you would hope that people did appreciate art a little bit more during during that period than they do now. Uh, I feel a lot like uh, BG and the people in Europe have a, more of an appreciation of art of all kind. Sure. But then again, you you know they have a. They have a tradition that goes back thousands of oh, years. Yeah. Over here, we have a tradition that, that doesn't go back very far. And I guess a lot of it has to do with the fact that we grew up in our beginning years. We were all in, it was all an agrarian country, right? Right. Yeah. Until the, what, the Industrial Revolution or something like that in the mid-1800s mm -hmm. and so on. And it's just, it's a strange, you know, it's a strange thing when you start, looking at, at the history of, of, of Europe and the U.S. And it just seems like they were going through what they went through years ago. Mm -hmm. And they seem to have come beyond it. But then all of a sudden, in the last couple of years, what do we see? We see marches back to the, going back to Mussolini and Hitler. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. and you start to say, wow, is this really true? You know, I mean, it's just interesting to study study the history and so on. And how art has made such a difference. Uh, Mike Holliber's wife uh, was, she just retired a year ago. She was a professor of art history at one of the schools here in the New York area. And uh, after we became friends and all, and we knew this, Nancy and I asked if we could audit her course. And you could, oh, cool. you could audit it for, for, for $13 a semester. Wow. You could, you could become a, an audit. And the period that, that uh, we chose was uh, art from 1945 to 1990. And of course, this, this you know, took in uh, our, all the famous abstract expressionists and, and yeah. so on and so on. And you know, what, what's interesting too about, about that is it's so reflective of American life. The art community would not bring forth or let many women come forth as major artists. Right. Yeah. It was it was all men. And and in studying this course and going and studying these women's paintings, they were every bit as amazing oh, yeah. as True. any of the men, you yeah. know. And you start to say, Wow, we just don't learn very well. It takes, do we? yeah. Yeah. It takes us a while. Are we stupid or what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's been true across the arts for sure.
Yeah. Yeah. And and you would you would you know you would anyway. It's uh, it it's when you really maybe it's because of this time in the pandemic and everything when you stop and start thinking about all of these things that you you find yourself confronted with because now you have time to think about them. Right. It's interesting how how you start to see how things go. You know, yeah. how does how does how do things <clears throat> develop? And it makes you wonder how does anything ever develop? Right. Well, I'll bet we'll we'll all agree that that music and arts in general have played a big part in making it through this terrible year. Well, you know, yeah. I mean, it's the real life saving joy of of mu the music you love. Now, whatever the music is, everybody's got their own music, but it's life saving. I'm sure. it's, it is. Yeah, I'm. I'm just so grateful to artists of every make and kind and model and genre because everyone's that's it's the creativity of making the most of the situation and this is a perfect example i am not technologically you know savvy it took a lot of really awkward unsuccessful shows to get to this point but you know, I mean, we do this selfishly because it makes us happy, but it's also just a way to connect and we can't, oh, right, it's, yeah. it's really fun. Sure. And yeah. then all of a sudden, you know, this conversation wouldn't have happened probably if we were up and working and moving. I'd, I'd like to think sometime it would, but you know, hey, it happened now because of this. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and even just in the course of tonight, all the different things that you've talked about and now you're going to share a link and classical music of this and that. And you try to find the good in it. I'm so ready for this fucking thing to be over with. <laughs> <laughs> and, Can you say that on, uh, there on YouTube? Is. Well, they haven't kicked us off yet. So. You can, uh, Somebody else before her has said it, I know, in one of these shows. I like that many times. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not a scary word anymore. I have, a, I have a little anecdote of my own that I want to tell you about relative to the women and men playing. When I started playing little gigs when I was 16 out in the community, somebody would come up and say, it was usually a nice drunken ba banker or something that put a dollar on the top table. Um, he would say, you sure are a good piano player. You sound just like a man. Oh, oh Lord. And I was an idiot at 16. And so I said, Oh, thank you. You know, <laughs> and over the years, I developed all kinds of different replies to that. Yeah. And, and finally, I, I got somebody one night that was really obnoxious. And he said, You sound just like a man. <laughs> and I said, No, I don't. I sound like myself. Amen. Yay. Yeah. And once I got past that one, I was like, No. Let it go. I've been in bands where I was the only woman. I've been in bands where I was the only white person. Yeah. And I was treated like gold from the musicians. Yeah. And so nowadays when somebody says something silly to me, I either ignore it or just try to turn it around. It's like uh, the world because it takes like 300 years to do certain things and 500 years to do other things. It's like, sometimes you just think, why don't they get a brain and just get with the program? Let's get know? on with it. Yeah. <laughs> right. We're in the middle of a lot of that right now. Oh boy, are we ever. Let me ask you, the three of you, uh, what do you think, and I know this is really uh, maybe a ridiculous question, but how do you see Nashville music coming out of this? Well, the, the, out, of the, out of the pandemic, I'm every, not talking about the yeah, Right, right. Yeah. Now, everybody is, uh, and it's the same in New York, I know, everywhere. I mean, there just is no music business. Uh, there's a, a few, a few sessions uh, have started to happen, uh, happen, but nothing like uh, an ongoing business. Uh, a few live places are trying to experiment with finding a way to, to do it safely. But uh, again, I mean, we had so much, hundreds of clubs here. 
many of them won't reopen. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and most of them haven't reopened. And I mean, essentially, it's just like the like your you, like Tony Cadillac and those broad, great Broadway players. They're out of work for mm -hmm. another year. And yeah. it's, that's how it's been here. The music, the music mm -hmm. community here just stopped on the first of March or, yeah. or so. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, I would say it's it's unknown. I mean, the spirit is there. You see uh, all, every day the, the players who aren't earning any money and aren't working anywhere. They're still making music. They're finding a way yeah. to do yeah. something. Do, a lot this, of the stars do kind, are yeah, this doing kind of thing. Uh, concerts without an audience. Yeah, and and going to the the big drive-ins around the country and. Letting people sit in their right. cars and listen to the music. So but otherwise, some, no. Some of it, I think, is for the live world, is just how, how long can people hold on before they have to right. try yeah. to do something else. But the spirit is really there. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, not just the jazz community, but all all the live musicians. Yeah. Music in general. Yeah. yeah. It, you know, um, I I feel like I I, I hate to be a rolling billboard but i feel like this is the time for us to say it's appropriate to say we're supporting live venues and in the link in the description of this are are some of our preferred venues um you know there are two sides of it we've got to support the venues we have to support the the musicians um and the venues i think are trying to be as creative as possible in nashville and beyond and I kind of think that's going to overflow into the the non degreed business person in me says that nothing's going to go back to the way it was. Um, unfortunately, people are going to figure out how to how to capitalize on the virtual concert and continue doing those things. Um, <coughs> I'm not thrilled about that, <laughs> but. I get I, I support it in terms of making ends meet now, but I look forward to it going away, quite honestly, because I want to go back to a live venue where I can sit oh, yeah. in the room and hear the music acoustically. And there's nothing that compares to that, right? Nothing. Right. Nothing. Um, but I think that there are going to be people who are going to try to capitalize on it because it is less expensive in some form or another, um, or record differently as a result. I guess I can't blame you for being savvy. I can't blame you for, yeah, you know, good things come from all of that, being thrifty and inventive and all that. But, yeah, I don't know. But, you know, I think that uh, in some way, shape, or form, going to be a new beginning. Yeah. I yeah. And, and, and I think for, let's say, uh, a music like jazz, which is usually, at least at this point, except in a few very high profile uh, uh, areas is, is a underground yeah. music. Yeah. And, and, you know, thank goodness for, you know, a, a city like Nashville that, that will support a Nashville jazz workshop, because this gives, this gives something very special to, to the whole, to the whole city. And mm -hmm. it makes available things to people from young kids who are just beginning to uh, professionals who want to teach and bring their students into it. And then to uh, amateurs who uh, are people that have worked in another line of work for 50 years and yeah. retired and still want to go back to play. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of thing, though, that in a place like New York, it's going to be a different kind of thing. And I'm sure in Chicago, any of the big cities yeah. that, that have been supporting a larger kind of music, only because of the expense, if nothing else, of the real estate. The real estate, To yeah. keep a club <clears throat> going and stuff like that. And yeah. I, think, I think that uh, the, other, the other factor that's really, uh, that worries me is how few people have an exposure Mm -hmm. to jazz. I mean, I mean, I'm not talking about anything from a big band, uh, whether you're playing in like more, more traditional concerts, like when Lincoln jazz, Lincoln center goes back and plays early Ellington music or Cy Coleman music, 
but you know whatever kind of music you play right up to you know uh cecil taylor and, and you know ornette coleman style groups or whatever but there is no there is no mass exposure for our music no. True. And that's that's the thing that at least gives the people an opportunity con to connect with the music. Yeah. And what BG said earlier about radio stations that are being phased out now. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a very good station in Houston that uh, I was supposed to do a. The guy was going to do two nights of tribute thing and an interview with me and so on and so forth. And then the week before, the uh, and his program's been going on for something like three years or five years, one of the two, uh, three nights a week, four hours a night. Mm -hmm. And they, they cut him down to two hours a night. Mm -hmm. And then they came in and said, you know, we want to keep you on the air, but you're going to have to change oh. the style of music. Oh. That you're and he said, he said, uh, no. I'll see you around the bend. No, and thanks. He yeah. And he walked out. Yeah. And the thing, the thing that's sad about it is that there is a really nice, like in Nashville, there's a really nice jazz audience in Houston. There always has been, yeah. Yeah. you know, but some new program manager comes in and he's going to change everything. Oh, yeah. And they have no familiarity with our music or what, or, or what it's about. And a lot of these stations, even even the NPR stations, don't have musicians who come from a background like all of us do, which uh, I'll say goes back to the the period of bebop and so yeah. on, you yeah. know. Yeah. And and to have us sit on the air and talk about it and do something mm -hmm. like what we're doing, yeah. Yeah. just yeah. to inform people about things. I mean, there's a lot about the about the business that's become. I mean, you you found clubs that are doing well or were before the pandemic, but the musicians weren't making any different salary today yeah. than they were 15 years ago. Yeah, as always. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the idea of sharing with the artists that are producing your business. So, so something is going to have to be reborn out of all of this. Yeah. I don't know how good it will be. Certainly, somebody asked me, says, when's your next date? I said, I may never have another one. Uh, really, that's everybody's answer these days. Yeah. I, yeah. I occasionally I'll see, I'll see somebody uh, who's put on Facebook. Uh, they did, they did like even a virtual gig. <clears throat> the first time I've played in front of anybody in seven months or since February the third or whatever. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's that's a long time. Yeah. At the practice yeah. room every day and keep your spirit in it. I'm I'm optimistic. I'm ready to get back to work. I I feel like it's not going to happen until it's ready. I'm not going to do it until doctors and scientists and vaccines and not only are we safe, but everyone in the audience is safe. Because what does it matter if we can do it if right. we're hurting people in the audience who are sitting close to each other? That's bullshit. We're not going to do that. But. Um, I'm, we're getting. We're going to do this. We will get back to something. It may not be the world that we knew before. It may be, but I'm. I'm clinging to the Superwoman, Wonder Woman. We're doing this. We are getting back. We're going to make this. We're going to get back to work. Everybody. I don't want anyone to say it's their last gig. I want them to say that they're just waiting. Just a little bit longer. I like that. Yeah. Keep practicing. Yeah. yeah. Are you? Do you practice every day, George? I do. Uh, I, really I, I, I I do, and the, some days it's some days I don't get around to it till like one a.m. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and some some days I'll say, you know, why why, why should I? A, a part of it too, I think. There's the connection, of yeah. course, with the horn. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I know um, I know my chops don't need to be good for anything in the near future but they will uh, but they will but, but yeah. there's also the idea of not giving up you know yeah i mean i think that's a that's a big part of it we have, i mean we some, have to win this we have to beat this some days in my prime um some days my prime I'm, and you may be the same way and i'll bet you practice every day marvin well <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you i'll tell you my people have asked me about that <clears throat> and and i tell them yeah i practice every day and as I have for 51 years, I get out and, and run every day. Mm, now, I'm, yeah. I'm, very, I'm very slow now. 
that women walk faster than I'm running. <laughs> but you do it. But, I, but I'm out there every day. And, and the reason, matter. and I, I practice every day. I look forward to getting, uh, getting to the horn. I want to feel that feeling in my body and on my face. Yeah. And, and, and one of the, one of the selfish reasons that I do it is because at 81 years old, I've, I've always been fortunate enough to be independent in my spirit. Yeah. When, when I was in the studios and you remember when they started overdubbing everybody two and three times for stuff like that, mm -hmm. for the years that I was there, I said, you have a, you signed a contract, didn't you? To the producer. Yeah. I says, well, then you have to pay the guys according to the contract. I said, you mean uh, you have to, I have to pay you a double if I, if I overdub you and use you twice? I said, no, you have to pay me double scale. And you have to pay double scale to every one of my compatriots here. And this is when me and Wayne Andre were the only two guys who would speak up about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because everybody else said, boy, if they get us the money, that's great. But if they're not here next week, maybe I will be, you know. <clears throat> but wow. I there's some at 81 years old, I know I only have a certain amount of time left. It may be 10 years, maybe 15, it may be 10 minutes. Yeah. But I want to feel, as long as I'm conscious of it, that I am the person that I have always been. Now, I know things change, but in my heart, I'm still 30 years old. Yeah. And I want, to, I want to approach my music like that, and I want to approach my body like that, and hope that, you know, like my father, at the time that when he passed, in the middle of the night, he sat up in the, in the bed woke my mother up by his doing so and then just lay back down and he was gone. He never suffered. Never, he was he never had, you know, went through that period of time of all that. I want to be the same way if I can. Right. right. So for me, it's, it's like proving to myself that I'm not, I may be older, but I'm not old. Yeah. I agree. And that's, and that whole Drink thing that. of still feeling, Drink to that. Drink to that. Yes, please. I'm so happy to have the opportunity to play uh, with this young lady over here with the BG and C.